So hello and welcome to another MICE conversation session. My name is Michael Collins. I run Travel Media. I'm based in Dublin normally, and we run the Dublin MICE Meetup, which is an outbound event for the MICE industry. Today, I'm talking to Tom Otley. Tom, you can see on screen beside me here. Tom is the hello. editor of Business Traveller magazine, and Tom normally should travel more than I do. Tom is based in London and uh, therefore offers us a somewhat unique perspective. Obviously, Tom is not uh, pure to the mice industry, but I think Tom will give us a very good perspective on what is happening. Tom is shaking his head uh, on, uh, well, business travel, let's say, I'll do my best. Um, which is very much mice. So, um, Tom, how are you? Thank you for joining us. How has the last 12 months been for you working from home? I assume that is home in the background. It is, it is home, yeah. Um, well, I mean, there have been advantages, I suppose, uh, working from home. I did a fair bit of it before uh, when I wasn't traveling, but obviously the, the big thing for all of us has just been the complete lack of travel, and that's both transient business travel, so those short trips where you're just going for meetings, but also all the big get-togethers that um, were a part, I guess, of everyone's um, calendar. So for, for someone like myself, there was um, ITB, the big travel fair in in March in Berlin, and that was preceded by the Hotel Investment Conference. We had the Arabian Travel Market, World Travel Market. Um, so all of those sort of larger meetings and conferences and exhibitions, and then all, all the, the smaller ones as well, which were, were very important. They've all, um, well, they've all gone on to Zoom if they uh, still exist. And, and I should uh, probably uh, warn everybody or um, flag the fact that um, we both agree we wear, wear or dress casual today, but Tom being Tom has a quirky sense of humor that he would put on a shirt and tie. So thank you for that, Tom. Well, the, the, the top half isn't the quirky bit. It's what I'm wearing on the bottom half, which is nothing at all. Yeah, so we won't ask. If it goes badly, I'm just going to move the camera. <laughs> The other thing, for the sake of clarity or transparency, I should say that uh, my company, Travel Media, we work with Tom and Business Traveler Magazine, and we manage Tom's YouTube channel. Um, yeah. So normally we would be editing yeah. Tom's content. Will this be on that, or will it be on your YouTube channel? Uh, it'll be on the Travel Media. Well, you can put it up onto your one as well, Tom. Why not? Let's see how it goes. Eh? Different audiences. Um, but I suppose that raises the question, and uh, normally we will be editing content from when you are flying. So you would spend a lot of your time on the road, visiting hotels, visiting airports, and, and traveling business class and reviewing the product. You've yeah, been unable reviews, to do yeah. that. So for no. most of us, we've gone online, but you have you know, very much been able to do that. So what have you been doing from a business traveler perspective? Well, we're still, I mean, we're still producing the print magazine um, the, the schedule of that has gone down um, a fair bit. So we used to be 10 times a year. I think we probably only had three issues since the lockdown last March. So three issues in 12 months. Got another one coming out in May and we hope to gradually ramp it back up. But obviously so much is uncertain at the time of this recording, which is you know, right at the end of March, beginning of April. So um, so we've still been doing the magazine, uh, really good traffic on the website, as you'd expect, because everyone wants to know what the travel news is. And as well as all the news, uh, we're also doing a number of uh, features around the sort of things that people are looking for. So around the so-called vaccine passports and why, in fact, you shouldn't call them passports, um, where you can get COVID tests, um, you know, and kind of relevant information that we, we update pretty much um, every day. And we try not to take the sort of sensationalist approach that you'll read in some of the press, because obviously the title is Business Traveller, so people actually just want to have the information without us being too campaigning. Having said that, it's, it's very tempting to campaign sometimes when you've seen the complete mess that our respective governments, by which I mean the Irish government and the British government, although French government isn't much better, is it, um, has made of, of travel. So, so that's what we've been doing. It's mainly busy as ever in terms of information but not much travel. I think the last time I went anywhere was the Canary Islands on a trip that uh, you were on as well. Um, and that was, we were hoping everything was going to reopen. Was that June last year or May or something like that? July of last year, so July 2020, yeah. yes. Yeah, so um, so that was the last trip. There's, there's talk um, of an only three or four weeks time of going to the WTTC uh, conference, which is in uh, Cancun, Mexico. So uh, we'll see whether that happens. But just getting there and back is a bit of a challenge. I think British Airways have got direct flights, but only twice a week. Uh, you don't want to go via the US transit, via the US, because I think then you have to quarantine um, yeah. in the US, I think. Uh, so I'm still trying to find out about that one. So, you know, long story, it's been a pretty terrible time for travel and terrible for so many people who've lost their jobs in travel. But we just have to look forward and 
you know, we're, we're lucky with the vaccinations and um, we have to hope that somehow they manage to reopen borders. But obviously it's not it's not great news in Europe at the moment for, for short haul travel. Um, no. And, you know, and as for meetings, you know, the sort of thing we're talking about now, meetings seem a long way off other than domestic meetings. Well, can I ask you, in terms of the, the audience watching this is primarily um, PCOs based in Ireland and the UK, um, but also a lot of convention bureaus based around Europe, people normally we would be talking to and working with on a regular basis. And that's the purpose of these conversations is to I suppose, keep people in the loop. And any of us based outside of uh, the UK, but still in Europe, are looking at the UK and seeing an amazing success story in terms of, at the moment, I think we're 30 plus million vaccinations and Europe as yeah. a whole has not done very well and is very much behind the curve. That said, I think the penny is starting to drop in terms of it's great now that we see the UK doing so well, but then as a visitor or as a traveller from the UK, where can you go if the rest of Europe is so far behind? Do you think the UK will open up when it comes to, I think, two dates that I note are May 17th and June 21st? Um, I can see the UK opening internally, but, you know, in terms of external travel, do you see that happening? You know, it, it's so difficult to say. I mean, they, when they start talking about, if, if all things were equal, I would say yes. It's when they start talking about these new variants. And obviously everyone's scared that somehow the variants are going to be resistant to vaccines and that's going to cause a, a new problem. And, you know, we did see that last year when suddenly there was this new variant uh, that was 70 percent more, or supposedly 70 percent more um, contagious. So it's it's almost impossible to tell. I mean, I know I talk to a lot of people who are active on the sort of campaigning side and also ones who are uh, supposedly contributing to the Global Travel Task Force, which is the one that's going to report in April the 12th and whose report the UK government is going to base its uh, decision on, supposedly. I think the one thing um, that we've realised over the last year is that for all the talk of how important travel is, and I know that everyone here um, believes that, and it's true, travel really is important for, for every reason we know, including GDP. For all the talk of how important it is, I have to say uh, we've not really been listened to by government. Um, you can understand in certain circumstances and some of the set of circumstances we've had because of, of the health uh, implications. But I haven't really seen any evidence that all the lobbying has made any difference to the government decisions. Um, and I, you know, I don't hold out much hope of an early start to the summer season. Um, I know lots of people you know, get in touch with me, as they, I'm sure they do you, saying, oh, I've booked in June to go X, Y and Z. Um, I think it's good to book and I think it's good to have something to look forward to. And, um, you know, most of those bookings can be changed for no extra cost. But but I don't think there will be a lot of uh, travel and certainly on the meeting side and the business travel side of things. I don't see much travel going on in June. And then, of course, you're into the, the summer season of July and August when people normally wouldn't be organising um, those kind of events or you know big meetings, that kind of thing. And then the, then it's all about hybrid meetings, isn't it, which we've um, written about a lot on the website. So, no, I mean, yeah, I don't I don't see a lot of travel going on in June, July, August other than internal. So internal to France, internal to Germany and, and internal to the, the United Kingdom. So we agreed we're seeing the same here in Ireland. We've had two task force reports, one uh, a parliament report in November or December and then another one back in the summer in July. And the government effectively ignored both of those, so yeah. rather concerning. We've seen, though, we have seen, as and you said, passport isn't the word, and certificate is the word that the EU has chosen to use. And we've seen people like IATA, and we know British Airways are testing stuff at the moment. But in reality, you know, it should be governments, both national and pan-national, you know, leading the way. But we saw the traffic light system, you know, most of Europe in reality ignored that. Um, so therefore, it's going to have to be industry, and I do believe it will be industry that will lead the way. What are you seeing? Is it hotels? Is it airports? Or is it airlines that are that are leading the way here in terms of pushing this forward? Well, I mean, I, I would say it's airlines. I mean, I, I, you know, I know some pretty high up people in hotels, and um, I haven't, again, I haven't seen much evidence that what they've said has been listened to. I mean, even around the, the quarantine hotels, it seems they were pretty much ignored because the quarantine hotels have just been a fiasco from start to finish. But looking at the positive side, um, I think airlines are being listened to. I also think that once the US, and this could happen, this could happen in the summer, 
if the US um, and the UK, for instance, can work out a bilateral whereby, whether you call it a travel bubble or however it works, um, with a bit of testing and perhaps with vaccination proof, um, you can start travelling between the UK and the US. I think if that does happen, then that could have a snowball effect on the rest of Europe, because if Europe sees that that's happening and they can persuade the US that they you know, they're up for it as well, then that could restart travel. I mean, you know, we've got offices in Hong Kong. I used to go five, six times a year. I don't think I'll be going to Hong Kong this year at all. But I do hold out the hope of getting to the US and, and not, you know, maybe even before the autumn. Um, so, so I'd say that would be the start of it, because if you can show, I mean, obviously it's one of the most profitable routes in the world, transatlantic, particularly London, New York. If you can show that it works, on certain routes to and from, say, the UK to the US, um, and then that snowballs, and there is talk of it um, working that way, then I think that could then lead to um, a general reopening. But, but of course, every country's got its, uh, you know, can control its borders. But if it feels like it's missing out, and its populace feels like it's missing out, not just in, in terms of holidays, but in terms of um, business meetings, and the idea perhaps that, you know, the UK is stealing a march on French business people or um, Germans, then, then I think that that could really help. And and from what I read over the weekend, that you know there is the possibility the US is open to the idea, and um, because they're in a similar state of vaccination to the UK, you know, in terms of um, percentage of the population. So that that's my big hope, UK US. It's where a lot of our readers were, you know, regularly visiting and flying to. So if that could happen, then I think we really are, you know, beginning to get somewhere. Yeah, agreed. And I think I've seen Roger Dow from US Travel kind of pushing that that message forward. And I think maybe even closer to home, Ireland UK travel would make sense in terms of creating a, a bubble between the two the two countries. Obviously, we have an open border in Northern Ireland. And uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but visitors flying into the UK from Ireland are not required to quarantine uh, in any shape or form. And you say they're not they're not required. No, correct. Yeah, no. so I, I can travel. I, didn't know that. I mean, I've got a friend who um, just went out to visit his mother in island and uh you know he did quarantine on the way there but on the way back he didn't yeah. correct yeah so it kind of makes sense that that's a, a corridor or a bubble that we would open um sooner rather than later and i think what you're saying makes sense in terms of if i look at the airline announcements we've seen Lingus make a big announcement out of manchester recently and you look at the dates that's great now. news wasn't it yeah. yeah um but it's all summer based it's not as if they're saying you know we plan to travel i mean you know, you're not going to launch a new route and announce a summer date unless you, you know, have some sense that that's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although, I mean, it's easy for them to announce dates and it's easy for them to put things in schedules. They can take them out just as easily as well. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's the hope. So what we've seen since the start of the year is travel become a lot more difficult. I mean, as you know, I've traveled extensively since last summer, but it's become harder since January because the testing has come in. So previously there were restrictions but now we have restrictions as in quarantine, but we also have testing and the PCR test is still the gold standard and it's very expensive and it's timely. Um, do you think going forward, once we have people vaccinated, that we're going to have testing as well? Because there's a lot of hope there when it comes to vaccinations and you know populations um, being vaccinated fast, as you say, US and UK. But if there's still testing, then that effectively, you know, stops that opportunity. Do you think that that's going to be the option? I mean, what are you seeing from airports and, and, and airlines in terms of their... I think, I think initially you will have it, I'm afraid. So, so for instance, if we stuck with this U, US-UK thing, I think how it will start is with testing, to, certainly test and release uh, when you're returning from the US into the UK. But the hope, of course, is that by doing those tests and release, the figures are so low of people who are caught, you know, so it says, well, I was negative here and I'm negative here. If the if the numbers remain low, then it's the sort of thing that can be relaxed. Maybe within five weeks, we're, we've got these sort of five week things here in the UK. Um, so if, you know, if you had a situation where, let's say in beginning of July, US, UK travel starts on this, maybe just on some routes, um, and they do test a release coming back in, yes, it would stop people going on immediate summer holidays because it'd be expensive for a family of four. But, but you could see a thing where when the data started coming in and all these individual business travellers or, or couples who would paid for it um, are coming up negative and then negative again, then that would prove the point that the airlines have been making, which is, look, it's very safe on board anyway, even with the new 
the new variants that come along that are more uh, contagious because of the you know the HEPA filters, the HEPA filters on board. So you know if if someone is negative when they get on board, they're not going to catch it while they're on, and when they come back, test and release proves it. Um, and then if you also throw in the fact that you know if you've been vaccinated, the chances of you communicating it or catching a serious illness. Um, uh, are lowered as well. That's kind of got to be the hope. So, so I, I think it's, it will be stages, and I do think the initial stage will involve testing, which will make it too expensive for most people um, to do it for a family holiday because you'd have to buy an awful lot of tests for you know, and then times all of that by four. But we'll start, we'll restart in a small way business travel, and there's plenty of people who really do want to get over there. And, and you know, in return, to um, you know, to meet up with colleagues they've not met in a year. Um, maybe meet people for the first time that they've met and interviewed um, only on Zoom or Teams or whatever. Um, so th there's a huge pent up demand, um, but it will be a slow start, I think. And, and, and I think probably only on a couple of routes to begin with until they've got the data which shows since this many of the UK is, is, um, is vaccinated and this much of the US you know, and with the test and release, it just shows that there isn't you know, a big risk. Um, for Europe, it's more difficult because when you've got the Prime Minister saying things like, well, these new variants will wash up on our shores, that kind of language just, you know, for the travel industry is so unhelpful. Agreed, yeah. So the irony is that, in fact, whereas many people have commented or suggested that actually this is the end of business travel, that we've all got used to Zoom, the reality is actually it'll probably be business travel that opens up first and, as you say, gives us the data. Well, it, it might on those routes. I mean, you know, if you'd asked me a few months ago, I'd say, no, it's leisure this summer and we won't get much business. I think business tra business travel will return. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Will it return to the same level it was in 2018, 2019? No, I don't think it will. Um, but, you know, just to take the example of our magazine, we've been around since 1977. And for the vast majority of that time from 77, right the way through beyond 2000, you know, business travel was a thing. I'm sure we were both doing it, but it wasn't a thing that everyone did all the time. The, the big explosion has been in the last sort of 15 years, deregulation, obviously, with the low cost carriers, but also the vast expansion of the routes and the Middle East carriers. Um, so when we go back, when they talk about the new normal, if it's the say, it won't go back to 2019 levels, I don't think. I mean, even IATA says, um, sorry, the, the um, uh, you know, the aviation body um, mm -hmm. says it won't go back um, to 2019 levels until 2024. You could argue it, it, it will never go back. It depends whether you throw in China and India. But, but is that necessarily a bad thing? Because I'm sure there's lots of people there saying, look, you know, let's travel smarter. Let's use this new technology. Um, you know, it's moved us all on. So, you know, speaking personally, if I was traveling every 10 days, which I was, if that then became every 15 days, or even every 20 days, would that be a disaster? No, no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't even be a disaster for our business because, um, you know, you tend to have high value business travel, by which I mean ticket price and also high value as in, you know, it really is adding value to the business. I think that's a positive thing. Um, you know, and there's also the more sustainable argument, which is, you know, can we keep expanding um, aviation in the way it was expanding in 2018, 2019? I'm not, I'm not so sure. Um, you know, is it a good thing? So, so, you know, if it goes back to some level, um, where would that level be? I don't know whether it would be the, what it was at 2000 or 2005 or 2010, but that wouldn't be, a, I don't think, a disaster for, for many people. And, it, and when it comes to big meetings and conferences, those, you know, ITB has always gone on. It's been going on for, I don't know how many years, 30, 40 years. So, so it will retain its position in the, in the calendar. But do you do you really need hundreds of thousands of people to go to it for it to be a success? I mean, I, I know you and I would frequently say there's just too many people here. We can't we can't get around. So yeah. so I think it's you know, it's it, business travel will return, but I'm not sure the 2019 um, levels and I'm not sure that's a, a bad thing necessarily. This might be the, the corrective that we needed. You might not feel that if you've just opened you know, um, a new route or you've opened a new restaurant that was relying on, you know, vast numbers. But, um, but you know, it is it will be a new world, but not necessarily a bad one, I don't think. No, and I think it, it'll be in many ways the same, but in many other ways different. And, and an example of that is, you know, a trend that certainly I've seen, I've done a bit of, you know, long haul traffic or travel over the last few months. And what I've noticed is that the front of the aircraft is completely full, not full with business travelers, but in fact, 
full with high-end leisure travelers who feel more comfortable flying business um, and can afford to pay for all the testing. So the business class product will still exist, but the, the audience might be that little bit different. What other trends are you seeing or can you predict at this stage? Um, well, I, I mean, it's funny what you say about the, um, the, there was a trend anyway, I think, for a more premium economy. I mean, that wouldn't necessarily make much difference in terms of distancing. But I think that comfort element also speaks to what we were just talking about in that if you have slightly fewer people traveling, that you have them, you know, and they're, maybe they're flying slightly less often, they will pay more for the tickets. And of course, you know, I'm not saying going back to the good old days, bad old days is, is what, where we want to go, but, but business travel used to be very, very expensive. And in the last, say, five or 10 or 15 years, it hasn't been expensive at all. Um, you know, even last minute travel wasn't terribly expensive. Uh, so, you know, I think one of the trends is prices will go up. Um, I think capacity has been taken out of the market. I think airlines will be very careful as they're putting capacity back in to make sure that it's profitable. Um, so I do see, I mean, not, not in the short, short term, they'll discount like crazy to get people traveling again. But I think um, once demand does return, I would expect um, prices to be a bit higher. And as you say, people paying a bit more for maybe a hotel that they think is safer. So maybe you know, they've got the, the, the money to put into the various cleaning regimes that all the hotels say they're doing now. Um, the same for airlines. It's increased airlines costs. There's no doubt about it. But some of those costs surely are a good thing. I mean, when they're talking about, oh, we now clean all the seat backs and the, the screens between every flight. And you think we, you weren't doing that anyway. I mean, that's pretty gross. So um, so the fact that the, the plane is going to be a lot cleaner and, um, you know, hopefully they're not going to be packed uh, immediately so that we can actually see what the effect of all of these people traveling is in terms of you know, infection rates and those sort of things. I think those are the short term um, ones. Long term, I don't know, or mid to long term. It's difficult because, you know, I was just reading this weekend, there are, there are new airlines planning to launch. Um, and, you, you know, you have to take your hat off to how optimistic people are. But um, there will always be a huge amount of competition. Um, and, and that's, you know, great for us, not, not just in terms of pricing, but, but also in terms of the, the choice of product. Um, so I think there's a lot to look forward to. Um, it's just that kind of, you know, darkest before the dawn. It's just that kind of waiting for these final few months um, in a way is kind of is more agonizing than the dark days, say, of uh, last March, perhaps, when we didn't know what was coming. So. Yeah. And uh, one trend I see is that I would have noticed uh, a lot of you know business colleagues who I wouldn't have expected this in the travel industry, Last year, we're very nervous about travel. And when I started traveling again last July, August, you know, I got a, a bit of, let's say, backlash. But now I get a sense from people I talk to, they're just fed up at this stage and they feel that it is safe to travel now. You yeah, mentioned, I think, I think, you mentioned yeah, I think the WTC. True. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, sorry to interrupt. The, um, yeah, I mean, the WTCC thing is, is interesting because when I've mentioned to people, oh, I'm thinking about going, I haven't had the... The same backlash that I would have had a year ago. I think part of that is though, you know, people do recognise, uh, certainly in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same in Ireland and um, and the US, that the most vulnerable in our particular nations. I know this isn't the case um, everywhere, and I'm not in any way taking it for granted. But if the most vulnerable have been vaccinated, it means if they catch it, they're much less likely to get very ill or die. Um, and of course. You know, everyone's got a different perception of risk. I mean, I guess you and I sort of took the view that if we did catch it, well, we'd survive. So, you know, we're prepared to take however small the risk was. We took all the precautions, obviously, with masks and, and sanitising and that sort of thing. But but there was always that extra argument. So, well, that's fine for you, but you could communicate it to someone who then could get ill. And I think everyone understood that, which is why we're being so careful. Now that isn't the case or certainly isn't in this society. I mean, if we've had 30 million who are vaccinated and all the vulnerable have been vaccinated and everyone over the age of 50, I think we're doing, we might even be doing 40 year olds sometime soon. Um, that argument holds less sway, that one where, okay, well, it's fine for you, but not for the others. The others have been vaccinated now um, and it's already up there at 70, 75, 80% um, efficacy even before they've had the second vaccination. So I think People recognise that, you know, at some point we've got to reopen society. Travel is only a part of it, you know, so it's going to restaurants, pubs, going to shops. I mean, we still don't have um, 
shops open other than the essential ones. So if supermarkets are open, everything else is shut. So mm -hmm. once those reopen um, and travel restarts in a small way, domestic travel, um, I think uh, people will be a bit more robust. Sure, there's going to be people who just say, no, I'm not prepared to take the risk. Well, you know, eventually they will take the risk, probably, because if everyone's going on holiday and they're not. Um, but in the short term, I think it's uh, I think most people, once they've had the vaccination, feel a lot more confident about getting on a plane. It will be difficult for travel managers, though, asking people to, um, you know, to go and attend something. Will you go to this meeting? Because uh, they'll, you know, if someone says, well, I'm not, not really confident, I think they'll have to accept that. Um, which is something you just wouldn't have come across um, a year ago. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, I've seen that within our own community. Some people have said, look, I don't want to travel. Um, but like I said at the start of this point, they've changed their tune recently. They feel more yeah. comfortable. So it's it's positive to see that you're looking forward to a conference next month and that you are planning to travel. And I do get an instinct that, you know, people will, as soon as it's safe or people feel it's safe and somebody's going to have to leave, by example, so there'll be, you know, there will be first movers on this, but I think everybody does want to get back to meetings and events. I think we're fed up with Zoom, etc. Tom, thank you for your time today. I greatly appreciate your uh, wisdom and experience. Um, for those watching today who don't know you and Business Traveller, can you just tell us where they can find you online? Obviously, we're not uh, able to travel, so where can they find out more about Business Traveller? Well, you can watch some of the watch some of the old reviews. And when I say old, they're only kind of 18 months old. But um, have, have things like the new Club Suite product on British Airways and the new um, Upper Class with Virgin. You can watch it all on the YouTube channel. So it's just YouTube, businesstraveller.com. Two L's, because we're not American. So businesstraveller.com, you'll find it on there. Or just go to our website, businesstraveller.com, and then you can you know read about it and then watch the videos from there. And, of course, we also have Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, all the rest of it. So. Excellent. Well, in the description, we'll add all those links so people can easily find that information and we'll add the video links as well right. to the end of this. So, Tom, I had shorter hair in those days. <laughs> yes, well, people can tune in to see you in pyjamas and shorter hair. So yeah, thanks again true. for your time, yeah. Tom. And uh, we hope to see you in person at a conference or an event very soon. Take care. Bye.